Hi, and uh, welcome to this presentation here at the Hopkinton Council on Aging. For, for you folks ha who have not seen me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 70 of us, uh, 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro, where mostly I am, and 10 in Boston. Because there are so many of us, everybody gets to specialize, and so I get to do nothing but elder law, which is what I like because I'm getting old. I'm turning 70 in January. Um, so. These presentations uh, here at the Hudson, Se at the excuse me, at the Hopkinton Senior Center have traditionally, I try to, what I try to do is four a year, I try to do really law-based presentations in the spring and then in the fall to do some more specific topics. And I decided for this fall that I would invite uh, some, some um, friends to talk with me and to talk about my friends Frank and Mary. So I have Fran Backstrand from uh, Bay Path um, Elder Services um, and Rebecca uh, Wild Wesley, who is a geriatric care manager, a what? You know, so she's gonna explain kind of what she does because, uh, it, because it's really important that you know her, that you know her and that Frank and Mary know her. And Doug Pack, who for many years has been working with um, Seniors Helping Seniors, which is this wonderful uh, home care uh, agency that only hire seniors. So it's literally seniors helping seniors. So they hire retired folks who are actually working in with, with folks in, the, in, in their homes and Doug's gonna talk about that. Um, the reason why they're all here is to talk about the way that my friends Frank and Mary need to be thinking about their lives at various points of their lives. So usually uh, I'm talking and I'm using this picture of Frank and Mary. I always talk about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And they've got these three kids and eventually they want to leave things to their kids. They'd rather not leave the money to the state or to the nursing home or whatever. They'd like to leave the money to their three kids. Um, but for this presentation, I want to talk about Frank and Mary at two different ages, at 70 and at 80. Uh, and then in the next presentation that we're doing in about a month, um, we're going to talk about just Mary at 90 and we're going to assume that Frank died. Because the issues that you're trying to deal with in your lives change depending on how old you are. And I want you to get a sense of that and what, what, how you should be thinking about things at these various ages and how these people should be involved with you at those various ages. So we're going to start off by talking about a slightly younger Frank and Mary. Uh, we're assuming they're 70 and they're just retiring. Uh, and they're both in good health and everything's kind of fine in their lives and their kids are doing fine and stuff. And so they need to be talking about, you know, stuff. And the question is, what stuff should they be talking about? Because what's significant about their situation now is they've got some assets, they've got a house, it's not really big, you know, it's $300,000 and they've got a savings account worth 300 and Frank's got an IRA worth two. Um, and then he's on Social Security making 2000 a month and she's making 1000 a month. So they're fine, they don't, they're debt free, but the question is how do they think about the rest of their lives? Because at this point in your life, and once again I'm going to be 70 in January, so I get this, at this point in your life the fact that you're going to die gets clearer. Not that you're going to die tomorrow, but that you're really going to die. Like when you're younger, like when you talk to your kids, they're like never really going to die in their heads. You know, it's still very totally theoretical. So for Frank and Mary, now there is like a, a life expectancy which is not a huge life expectancy. For, for Frank, it's 14 years, and for Mary, it's a little over 16 years, right? Um, and they want to make sure that those years are as good as possible. Now it is, for many... Frank and Mary's, Frank's and Mary's, it, there is a tendency to, for them to be thinking about their, their lives from the perspective of where they've been. Oh, I'm 70 now and you know, it was great raising the kids and I used to be able to do all this stuff and you know, I'm kind of not a can anymore. And that's all fine, except that it's, it's a waste because that time is done. So to concentrate on that time, what's the point? Whereas, the goal of this is to really have folks think about, so if I'm thinking about my future, if I'm thinking about the rest of my life, how can that be as good as it can be? How can I make that be as good as it can be? Now, in order to figure that out, you need to kind of talk to a set of people, um, and, I wanna, and I'm going to kind of urge you to think about this as being the set of people that you want to talk to. Um, but you first, you want to outreach to, to, to really to, to three organizations to start. First, the Senior Center. Now, this presentation is very much 
for the people who aren't here, right? It's great that you came, but many people have still never walked into the senior center because it's only for old people. Because why? Because really, it's just like new. You know, it's a different place. And so why should I go to the senior center? But the senior center has all of these wonderful things to it. Um, so you want to talk to the folks at the senior center. You want to meet a geriatric care manager. And you want to know the people at the ASAP, Aging Services Access Point. Um, there are 25 of these organizations now statewide. Each one of them covers a piece of the state. Um, Bay Path covers our area, if, uh, and together with 13 other communities, a total of 14. And, and, and their point is they are the vehicle through which, or the funnel through which all federal and state money for seniors comes. So if there is a program for seniors that you're eligible for, they know about it and you're probably going to qualify through them. So you want to be talking to them. So the Senior Center. Well, you know that the Senior Center is fun and games. You know, that's always true. And, and remember in the old days, it was always about bingo. You'd always hear about the Senior Center being about, and that's like so not the Senior Center today. As a matter of fact, I come to Hopkinton a lot because I do legal advice here and some other things. There's just constant activity here and a ton of people. So for folks who haven't been, you just have to come. First of all, for the fun and games. Also for the food. Quality of the food is really good here from what I've been told from seniors who are here. You, get help, you can get help here with some really big issues for free, typically. Um, every year, not only do you need to re-examine what your drug plan is, what your Medicare D drug plan is, but also how the rest of your Medicare package works. And you have the right to re-sign up or to change that package every year in the fall. The people who are trained to help you figure that out are the Shine counselors. And they're terrific and they can really help you with this. They've got tax people here that can help you figure out your taxes in the spring. Do you still owe money? Can you get money back because of the fact if you're a homeowner or whatever? They've got these great programs. There are educational programs like this one, right? Um, but, and most importantly, if you're Frank or Mary and you're still healthy, there are all these volunteer opportunities. Because I think, it, 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 the more that I think about senior issues, the key to successfully getting older is we're all in this together. We're in this together, older people. Our kids are all over the place and they got a ton of stuff to do, right? And you, you're going to count on them when there's an emergency, but really the people you need to be close to are folks that are going through many of the things that you're going through. And if you're still young and healthy, you kind of owe it to the system to volunteer and to try to be involved. So, what is a geriatric care manager, now called an aging care life professional? Aging life care. An aging life care professional. So, the, one of the challenges as you're, getting, as you're getting older is to kind of figure out what all of these other people are out there, what these, all these other organizations are, and how you can structure your life so as to live it as well as you can live it, right? So there are actually people that specialize in helping you do that. They are often uh, nurses or social workers who decided that this is the niche that they wanted to pursue. Um, and you need to meet one. I wanted to introduce you to one because she's really good and she's like fairly close to here, Rebecca Wild Wesley, just to kind of talk about what Frank and Mary should be thinking about when they're 70. Rebecca. So actually, I was wondering if part of doing a presentation today is that we all have to share our age because I know Art started out saying that he was almost 70. I'm not almost 70, but I'm in my 60s, so I'm already starting to anticipate what's going to be happening, and I'm really personally on the edge of what does retirement look like, when do you take it, how long do you push it, so I think, uh, I think we all have a little bit of skin in the game when it comes to trying to decide where, what we want to do with the rest of our lives and what that trajectory is going to look like. So. So we are aging life care professionals, mostly because nobody wanted to be known as geriatric, because nobody wants to be geriatric anymore. So we go back and forth. So on a regular basis now, when I talk to someone, I say, I'm an aging life care professional, also known as a geriatric care manager, which doubled the length of my introduction. So there you are. So we work with families um, and with elders directly to be able to help them make a plan for the future. 
Sometimes we get involved when there's a crisis, and hopefully the crisis isn't in your 70s. It could be later on in your life when perhaps an accumulation of health conditions or mobility issues start to make it that you need to have someone to be able to help you. Connecting with an aging life care manager early in your 70s, when you foresee you have a pretty smooth course but you want to have an idea what's going to happen, I think like buying insurance, if you get to know someone, you talk about all the aspects of your life as to what it is your goals are and what your concerns are. And for some people, once in their 60s and 70s, they start to have some chronic medical conditions that they're keeping an eye on. Perhaps with retirement, you're getting an opportunity to exercise more, to be able to walk a little more, to socialize, to have a better work-life balance because it's not been probably very balanced prior to that. So a lot of work, it's worthwhile sitting and talking about a deliberate conversation about what does aging look like for me, not unlike when your high school students are looking at what college is going to look like and what campus they want to have and what course of study do they want and how far do they want to be from their parents. You know, it's the same kind of a deliberate activity. Often we fall into our aging issues and literally we sometimes fall, but it's an opportunity in this decade to be able to look at what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, mm -hmm. how much can you depend upon children to be able to be supportive, your peer network, are you in the right house, you have the right space, do you, are you going to be able to age in that space and how long do you want to be there for. So, this is kind of our little grid that really does take a look at, I'm sorry, I just walked in front of my grid. So, so many of these options are things that we're starting to talk about. What's your money look like? I don't help you with your setting up your retirement savings. Really, I help you understand how to make it last as long as possible to be able to access the least expensive services up to as you get to have more needs, more expensive services. Helping with housing options. Do you know what all the choices are in your area? To be able to understand where it's affordable and again to be able to live in, an, uh, in a house that supports your body physically, that you have a good fit with your house. Um, there are issues that often when we get involved, especially in the 70s, if you haven't talked to an attorney and if you've only talked to a real estate attorney, I would guide you toward talking to an elder law attorney because there are different issues when you're an elder than when you're buying a house or when you're managing your business. So you need that specific set, skill set to be able to help you to be ready for what comes next. And that has to do with documents and things like that. Art will talk about that. Um, Local resources, and that's really where BayPath comes in, but you know, we are going to recommend to people the first place they should be engaging is their senior center. There's a wealth of opportunity there to be a volunteer as well as to gain services. And it's a, it's, you, you're, in, if you're, you're living in your town, this is your space. This is a place for you to be. So we're going to often push you back and engage, help you engage in what you already have that's available. Sometimes we do a little bit of family counseling, not as counselors, but to say getting everybody around the table so that everybody knows what kinds of issues. Children know what your plans are so that they can be supportive to be able to help with that. We are a private pay service. This will be different than Bay Path. So people pay for us out of their, sometimes their long-term care insurance or out of whatever their funds are to be able to start to finance their future. This is something that you anticipate. Again, you're going to pay for services that will come to you and we're one of the services that hopefully help you in the long run to spend less because you've thought things through very carefully. Um, let, me, let me get this forward. Uh, my name is Doug Peck, and like you said, I uh, had a company, and I still work for a company called Seniors Helping Seniors. Uh, we, we are now from the Boston area to throughout the Metro West area. And I want, I want to talk about two things. I've given this, you know, uh, a version of this presentation. I went around last year to a lot of Rotary Clubs and uh, talked about a lot of uh, what I'm going to talk about here. And what I found out is that people do, everybody says they want to stay home, but there is a cost to staying home. And w one of the things is that at some point you will need help. And I was really pretty surprised to find that most people 
didn't know what help was out here. And I think that's one of the reasons I really wanted to join with Arthur. Because if you haven't had uh, a major diagnosis or an incident that sort of puts you in a position where uh, you're not being able to do some of your, the tasks that you want to do, that you used to be able to do at home, or to be able to drive where you want to drive, something has happened, you don't know what's going on and you don't know what's available out there. And for me, I think of it in sort of two very broad ways. Um, well, we'll talk about this first. One of it, when, when uh, something happens, two things happen. One is you're less inclined to stay engaged with the social network that you have. I see it all the time when people, something happens, they're used to coming to the senior center, they're used to going to play bridge, they're used to going out on Friday nights for dinner with friends, and it's just not happening anymore because you're physically, it becomes too physically difficult to, number one. And number two, when you're not feeling well, for whatever reason, you just don't feel like engaging with people. And as you get older, it gets harder and harder, I found, to sort of be able to bounce back from that if you're not prepared and think about that beforehand. So you become less active, and less active leads to becoming a little more isolated in what you do. And we, we just see that in all of our communities uh, that we go into. So when we think about what kind of help is available, I think about it in two broad ways. There are, there's help that you need that's sort of the task-orientated physical help. If for some reason you, uh, you get a knee replaced or a hip replaced and you're on a walker, even for a short period of time, there's a lot of things in your house that you can't do. It's hard, if you're by yourself, it's hard to make a bed, for example, if you're, if you're on a walker trying to balance and make a bed. It's hard to do laundry. It's even hard sometimes to stand at a stove and cook. So there are people, uh, certified nursing associates, personal care assistants, that uh, you can hire or will come in through Bay Path uh, and give you that kind of specific task-orientated help that you need to do just to be able to maintain, <coughs> excuse me, you know, a comfortable existence in your home. The other piece where we focus, and I call it more non-traditional, is is a dealing with more the social isolation piece because you uh, are uh, you are more homebound, maybe not completely homebound, but you are at home more, and to have someone to come in and help you with other, with other tasks around the house and just socialize with you. I started in this business about mm, nine years ago now, uh, when my father had passed away and my mother was at home and trying to stay at home. She didn't want to uh, go into any type of assisted living. Um, and she lived in Ashland. I grew up in Ashland. I, I live in Southboro now. And just running back and forth, trying to, to you know, do her to-do list that she had for me once or twice a week, uh, and you know, then work a full-time job was a bit stressful. But what I learned was what my wife told me actually is that look, you know, you can hire people to go out and do a, mow the lawn, shovel the driveway, do all that stuff. What she really wants you to do when you go over is to sit down with her and have a cup of tea and just talk to her for a little while because she's not getting out like she used to get out. Uh, in the winter, yeah, the driveway gets plowed, but it gets, it's still pretty icy and she's afraid to go out and walk on the driveway down to the mailbox. So she's, she's home alone a lot. So you really just want to go over there and sit. And I'm saying, really, I don't have time <laughs> just to sit and have a cup of tea. But I realized it was really true, and it was really the most important thing for her, was that kind of socialization and that kind of interaction. Um, we lived in a, uh, a neighborhood, but there was only one neighbor left. She was as old as my mother across the street. Everybody else had gone for various reasons, either to live with children, to go to Florida, or into some type of assisted living. And, you know, it, uh, it made for some, you know, it, it really did isolate her. So, I, I'm going to echo what Art said. When we're trying to do is not just live at home, 
but live in the community that you're in and stay in this community because you're familiar with it. And you do have a lot of connections here, even though you may not see them as frequently. And while there are physical concerns, you can't overlook the social and emotional concerns. I mean, loneliness is really one of the, uh, can lead to some really physical disabilities. Even in the UK right now, they've created a minister of loneliness because it becomes so prevalent for people, because people even in their 70s are, are still oftentimes living, living alone. Um, and I'm gonna switch right now and go back a little bit to seniors helping seniors. One of the things at 70 that people need to do is stay engaged as much as possible. And I would encourage everyone to be that social connection for somebody else. I don't care whether you work for us, or we, we, we actually pay people to do this, but you should think about going out and helping others and, and stay connected. It's not just good for the person that you're helping, but it's also really rewarding for yourself. And I know I see two men here. Men don't think of themselves as caregivers. We're not socialized, per se, to be caregivers. Uh, so I really think of us more as companions and, and just sort of a friendly neighbor. Uh, and it's really important for both parties to be able to do that. And so I would really think while you're able to, you're physically able to, to give back to your community because it's gonna help everybody. And at some point, you may need that kind of help as well. So I'm gonna introduce Fran Backstrom for, from uh, Bay Path Elder Services. So hi everyone, I am Fran Backstrom and I work at Bay Path Elder Services in Marlboro. And Arthur was correct, we do cover the Hopkinton um, service area. I do want to just go back to the, um, the acronym ASAP, which is 40 some odd years ago, the state in its wisdom created this entity where it was an access point for aging services. And they decided the acronym ASAP made sense. We like to say as soon as possible because you do want to actually reach out to us or to one of our partners here at the Senior Center, your outreach and social workers, to learn about resources and services that may be available to you to help you live an independent life as safely as possible for as long as possible in the community setting of your choice. And that's what we're all about. While it says that 70 is the new 50, that means I'm gonna work for another 20 years because that puts me in my 40s and that sounds really exhausting. <laughs> but what we have found is because people are working longer and into their 70s, we've lost a group of people that used to volunteer for such things as um, Doug was saying, friendly visitors. 20 years ago, almost every one of the senior centers in our catchment area had friendly visitor volunteers. And now they don't. Some of the programs have gone away completely because they just aren't volunteers because people are still working. But Bay Path does have volunteer opportunities as well. We have boards and advisory councils where we're always looking for people who live in our service area who either are in the industry or are um, older adults themselves to help us understand what the needs are in the community so that we can take those funds that we get through the federal government and the state and channel them into programs that are beneficial. We also have our Meals on Wheels deliverers who actually make commitments on a weekly basis to deliver home delivered meals to those who are less fortunate or are unable to get out. The Healthy Living Programs, which I actually think there is one coming here to Hopkinton this fall, which is fu a federally funded, evidence-based, healthy living exercise program that we partner with our senior centers to provide for, your, um, uh, for you to participate in. So these are ways in which Bay Path works with your senior center and with our older adult community to try to provide resources and services that help keep you um, safe and independent in the community setting. We do want you to know us, know about us before you need us. We have options counselors and in our information and referral department, which can help you with just about any question you have. Um, if we don't have an answer, we'll help research it for you. As an example, we had somebody who was homebound and had a pet that they needed uh, care for, and they want to know was there a home, a veterinarian who would come to their home. 
we didn't know, so we started doing outreach to the veterinary hospitals and clinics in our service area. And we've now found four that will actually come for, for cost, but they will come to an elder's home to care for their dog or cat if the elder themselves can't get out. So we're always building our information and resources to try to tailor it to the needs that we're seeing as they evolve in the communities as people age differently and um, it's not just chronological, sometimes it is you know, how the hand that was dealt you actually. Um, the caregiver program is because we know that caregivers are the, the, the backbone of keeping people in the home for longer periods of time. If the caregiver doesn't take care of themselves, they can't take care of the person, the care recipient. I look at my parents who are 85 and 94, and they are co-caregivers. I don't think either one of them, after 67 years of marriage, um, would do well without the other. But they're fortunate to have each other. Some people don't, and so we want to ha actually help them with those services. But supporting the caregiver is important. We do have a program that helps provide support and resources for the caregiver to remember how to take care of themselves so that they can better take care of their uh, care recipient, whether it's a family member or a friend. Our in-home services are what BayPath is all about. We have many different programs that help provide non-medical services in the home um, depending on your ability and need and then some of them are insurance based and or um, you have to be eligible for the mass health programs to access. But everyone, if you're over the age of 60 and have unmet needs in your physical or house um, activities of daily living, you can qualify for the home care program, which in part is subsidized by our state taxes. And I think we get more into that when you get a little older in the second half of the program. So. Frank and Mary's legal issues at 70. Um, for a lot of folks coming in to talk to me, it, it, I, they find themselves kind of leaving saying, well, that was easy. We didn't really have to do very much. I, if you're 70, um, one of your issues uh, coming in to see me is, or if you're talking to, a, uh, to an attorney is, well, if one of us dies, we want to avoid the probate process. But usually that automatically happens if you're Frank and Mary because you own your assets jointly or regarding the assets you don't own jointly, like, like Frank's IRA, he's named his wife as the death beneficiary. So all of that's going to happen automatically. Now, if you are concerned at that age about making sure that when the two of you, ha after the two of you have died, that you won't have to go through probate, well, then you can create a trust at that point. You can create a revocable and amendable trust and put your assets into that trust. But I also often tell people, you know, you don't have to do that yet. You can wait until somebody's dead. I mean, after the first spouse has died, at that point, it's really important to take care of those things because when the second spouse dies, unless you've kind of arranged things more carefully, your kids are going to have to face the probate process. But you may not need to do it then. Uh, asset protection. A lot of people will come in to me to talk about asset protection because they're very concerned about nursing home care. Often, though, that is an issue for folks who are older, right? Um, because the, while certainly there are cases of early, of kind of early onset dementia, often they're not happening to Frank and Mary or they're not soon going to be involved with that system. Also, as I regularly have to tell couples, if that happens to you, if you're a couple and one of you needs nursing home care and needs a lot of care at home and needs to qualify for mass health, you can do that in, at that time. You don't have to rearrange your assets ahead of time. At the time somebody needs to qualify, they can simply shift all their assets to their spouse, while the person trying to qualify has to have very little in assets, less than $2,000. The spouse can own the home. The spouse can have a lot of assets, can have up to $126,420 in assets, and can have unlimited income. So you can quickly, at the last minute, simply shift assets to your spouse and have your spouse rearrange his assets so that you can qualify. So that's not the big issue. The big issue, if you're Frank and Mary, is keeping control if something happens. If something happens. If you have an accident, if you have a, you know, a minor mishap or a minor medical issue, and you need to be dealing with, you need somebody to deal with things for you, typically while you're getting better. That's what a power of attorney is. The reason for that is, is this. It, while it used to be that well, you remember when we were growing up, we were all like about the same age. Remember when we were growing up and like somebody would have a stroke and they'd die, right? 
and somebody would have a heart attack and they died. And, and it doesn't seem like that happens anymore. I finally saw a statistic that validates that. In 1970, if you had a stroke or a heart attack, your likelihood of being dead within 14 days was 33%. Today, it's 3%. That's the change. You don't have one of these incidents and die. Of course, you're not feeling great at the end of one of those incidents, so you probably need somebody to be taking care of things for you. That's what the power of attorney and the healthcare proxy are for. The power of attorney allows somebody to act on your behalf. Uh, raise your hand if you have a power of attorney. Oh, not quite everybody have to have a power of attorney, right? If you do, though, I would urge you to go back and look at it, because if you're Frank and Mary, um, first of all, you want to make sure that that power of attorney says that the person you named as your attorney has the power to make gifts to himself or herself in an infinite amount. Um, most powers of attorney, and as a matter of fact, I saw one earlier this week of somebody coming in for legal advice and brought in their power of attorney, and they said, you know, the problem with this power of attorney is that it limits your attorney to not being able to give away things on your behalf beyond the so-called uh, um, federal estate tax exclusion, which is now $15,000 a year. That's a real problem if I need to be helping Frank or Mary to rearrange their assets in order to qualify for mass health, uh, so, which means that I need to help to have, to have assets be shifted from one spouse to the other, given from one spouse to the other at the last minute, and those assets are worth a lot more than $15,000. So you need to make sure there that isn't that kind of exclusion. Uh, you want to check that in your power of attorney. The other thing is if you're Frank and Mary, at that typically, when folks bring in their powers of attorney, they've named each other as the attorney, and that's all. They haven't named an alternate, because when they were younger, they weren't worried about that. Now, you do want to worry about that. You want to make sure that if you're incapacitated, and your spouse is also incapacitated because you had an accident, or, or your spouse just doesn't want to deal with the legal issues, they want to be with you because you've had, this, you've, you know, you've had this heart attack or whatever, you want to name an alternate. That's typically one of your kids. You can name more than one of your kids jointly and severally so that any, either of them can handle any of these things. You want to make sure that's in there. Finally, on the healthcare proxy, same thing. You want to make sure there's an alternate so that if you've got a problem and we need somebody to make a medical decision and your spouse either can't or would just rather not, right, name one of your kids. So those are the legal issues. There aren't that many. So now, Frank and Mary at 80. Frank and Mary at 80 are older. Um, suddenly, Frank's life expectancy, you know, Frank had lived, just lived 10 years. His life expectancy only went down by about seven. He's still got a life expectancy of uh, eight years. And, and Mary's life expectancy is now nine years. So their life expectancies are both less than 10 years. So now they're looking forward. They want to make sure that their remaining years are good, but they're getting closer to the, you know, it, death is real now, right? And they're probably not feeling as well. So the question is, if Frank or Mary has a physical problem or a cognitive problem and they want to stay independent, what do they need to be doing? What are the many things they need to be thinking about? What are the home adaptations that they can make so that they can stay at home? How do they figure that out? How do, how do they figure out who they can talk to, who they should hire regarding that? What about if the home is okay, but they really do need some assistance in order to stay at home because they just really don't feel like having to do all of the meals, make the bed all the time, do the, all this stuff, you know? And for Frank and Mary at that point, I know they've always done it themselves. And so I'm talking to them and they say, you know, but you know, I don't need to pay anybody to do that. Well, that's true. You can kill yourself continuing to mow the lawn. However, if you're Frank and Mary, You've still got your home and quite a bit of savings, and chances are the money only has to last for about another 10 years. You're going to be okay if you hire somebody to mow the lawn, you know? So you want, somebody, you want to be thinking about that. And if you're Frank and Mary, you want to be thinking about, is it time, can I still stay at home? Can I safely stay at home? And if I can't, what are the alternatives and can I afford them? Once again, this is, another, this is one of those places where you want to be talking to your, your, your aging life care professional as well as your ASAP, and you probably in various situations want to be, ta want to be talking to Doug. So. so here I am again. So generally I find 
This is when I tend to see people for the first time. They haven't reached out to me in their 70s. They've reached out in their 80s. And likely it's because they've had a diagnosis that changes what they're now going to have to plan for. They may need to be considering having more services because they're not able to do things as well on their own. It's possible that even despite a lot of home modifications, home still isn't the best place for them to be. And what does that look like? And what can they afford? So we talk about that. when. Um, when Doug was talking earlier about um, being able to adapt a home and make it work, he was also talking about social isolation. And sometimes the reason why we move to a new place is not just because we don't have a railing in our shower to be able to take a shower safely, or we have stairs out front, but it's because we can't get out. And when we're not getting out, we're now not able to socialize with our friends, who, by the way, are also in their homes, unable to get out. So it, it, it doesn't work to have phone calls. Um, it's not enough socialization for people. So it's not a bad thing to be thinking about what would it take to be able to be back with my community again. So that might mean having somebody come in to get services, to be able to be a friend who might be able to take you out, or it might be having you move to a place where there are more people who are generally your age, and it's a little bit more accessible, and you're able to get out. So you have to think about it. And you can talk about all of those things with a, a care manager, and you kind of decide. You do the puts and takes. What works for our family? What kinds of uh, mobility issues are we worried about? What kinds of social issues? Where are our children again? You put it all on the table, and there are not often opportunities to be able to talk about everything and, and, and kind of weigh out what the pluses and the minuses are. When my kids were young, I have three children, I would say at some times, we're going to have a family meeting. Oh, no, not a family meeting. <laughs> You're going to tell us something, and we don't want to hear. And that's really, that's not the goal of this kind of a family meeting. It's really about, let's make sure everybody is on the same page, at the table, whatever that looks like, to be able to help you to live the next years. It's, I'm going to jump to driving retirement before I talk about caregiving because, again, one of the things that often forces or puts us into social isolation is having to, we use the word driving retirement, which is a nice word for taking away the keys, which is also, it's a very aggressive term. But generally, at some point in our aging, we may find that we're no longer safe on the road. And it may be about our reaction time, it may be about our vision, maybe our neck is so stiff we can't really turn side to side and look over our shoulder, uh, and maybe have had a stroke, maybe there's a memory problem, maybe we're having difficulty judging distances. For any number of reasons, you might have a conversation with your doctor, with one of your children, with a police officer, all of which might lead to having to make a decision about driving. And when we stop driving, we immediately become homebound. We're just, that was how, that's how we all get out. Very few of us walk to the senior center today, although this is a community where it's walkable. You're able to actually, it's reasonable to think someone could walk here. But many of us now are living in communities that you can't walk to get somewhere safe and, and to be useful. So driving retirement often ends up, again, social isolation. We end up having to find other ways to get around, which maybe aren't very available. And we end up then saying, perhaps it's time to move. And on a personal note, when my mother had to stop driving, she lived in a very walkable community, but that it was cold all the time, and she just couldn't tolerate the cold. She made the decision it was time to move to an assisted living because she wasn't going to be able to get the services and she wasn't going to be able to be socially as engaged as she wanted to be. The other thing that often happens is we still have Frank and Mary who are together and married, but perhaps now one of them has uh, a health issue that's requiring the other to be in charge, to be more of the caregiver. I find this is a very difficult time in a marriage um, when pe previously everybody was standing on their own and, and you were mutually, you know, you were a couple and having fun and raising children and doing all the things you do in a marriage and now one of them is going to take some responsibility for the other. This is a really big transition. And in the most extreme case, if it's really often dementia is what means you've really virtually lost your partner as a caregiver, although they're physically still present. 
the personality's not there, you don't have shared decision making. It's a very difficult transition. And in that caregiving role, if it's for something around a dementia issue or something around um, someone not being safe in the home, that caregiver now is virtually homebound. They're not able to get out. They may be on call all the time and there's no, they don't have their spouse to run ideas behind. So that caregiver now is making decisions, is this the right home to live in? Having to go to the elder law attorney to be able to decide if everything's in place to be able to, have to do what comes next. And then they have to make that decision alone, maybe with their children, but they've lost their marital partner, which I find really um, a real challenge and something a care manager, we don't become the marital partner, we just become a partner to be able to help with what's it gonna be like going forward. Declines in health and mobility. This is, you know, they're all tied together. You can't get to the doctor. You also can't get to church. You can't get to the senior center. Um, uh, you know, we're able to make sure that medical appointments are still kept. You still are taking medications. You know, all of the things that we want to put a lot of effort to into our 70s, maintaining our health, becomes even more important um, to be able to manage medical conditions, have, let them have the least impact on you to be able to continue to live your life. So a care manager is really going to be that partner. Um, there are a lot of partners though here. We're all really as partners and I tend to think of it as that we are all, your partners are your family and those, all those professionals whose skill set is all about this. This is, this is what we do. This is our patch and this is an area we always enjoy being able to spend time talking to people and helping things to get better. And they do often get better. Doug Peck? You know, we're, we're treating this, we're treating aging a bit as, you know, uh, always being in decline. And I, I don't think of it that way. I think different opportunities open up, opening up. But there are some significant things that do go on. And I'm going to just tell you a quick story that illustrates what we do rather than, rather than try to tell you what our companion does. Uh, I still think about uh, social, iso social isolation and loneliness quite a bit. One of my very first clients was not socially isolated. She lived in a really nice home in Southboro. Uh, she lived with her son, daughter-in-law, and two, at that time, teenage boys. And she had just been widowed about a year ago and had moved in with them. And again, if you were to look at it from the outside, it was a very active family. Uh, they, you know, both parents, her son and daughter-in-law, were, had very senior level positions. The boys were active in schools and in sports. Uh, but she was probably the loneliness, the loneliest person I've seen in a long time because she was really isolated. She had all this activity going on around her, but she never really felt a part of it. And it wasn't because they were doing this intentionally, it was just because it was one of those really busy households where everybody was going in different directions at the same time. The, you know, uh, the daughter-in-law, I mean, if she got home before seven o'clock at night because she worked in Boston, it would have been a real treat. So uh, the son was always driving kids to school or to, to sports, et cetera. It was really busy. And so they brought us in just because she was in an empty house a lot all by herself. She couldn't get out. She was in her late 80s. And she was pretty depressed because it was the one year anniversary of being widowed. I happened to bring uh, two folks in, really just to help her with make sure she had a nice lunch, get her out for a walk in the neighborhood. Again, a couple of hours of just socialization. What happened was, and it, I don't know why I was surprised by this, that I, but I was, both of my caregivers were widows themselves. And they started talking about that with her. And she talked to me afterwards, after about a month or so, and told me, you know, I've never been able to talk about my widowhood with anybody because I moved right in here with my son. I can't talk to him about what it was like losing his dad. I can't really talk to my daughter-in-law because we just have never been that close. So this has my, been my first opportunity just to relate to somebody who's had a really significant life experience that, uh, you know, that is similar to mine. So you don't have to be alone to be lonely. 
And uh, this really provided uh, just an incredible level of support for her that um, I don't know how else she would have gotten it. And really, and really, really ended up improving the quality of her life. So that's an idea of the really big impact of what a companion can do for somebody. And it, for me it was, uh, now I think about it more, but at the time it was like, oh yeah, I just, I just didn't realize that there was that much going on, and particularly for women, just ex being able to exchange that kind of uh, information was really incredibly helpful. So I'll turn it back over to Fran. So I could actually spend an entire hour talking about all the programs and services that are available um, at, the, uh, at Bay Path Elder Services that can help. But what I would like to do is actually start in the middle and tell you, start with information and referral. Call us, let us know what you're looking for, and we're going to provide you with the information and resources so that you can make a decision. If you feel you need some follow-up or some um, decision support, we have our options counselors who can come out to the community, either here at the center or at your home, sit down at the kitchen table with you and your family, spread out all the options and help you understand the differences between assisted living and subsidized housing or um, continuing um, communities, uh, adult communities, helping you make that decision. And if one of our programs or services that we offer is what you're looking for, we will then make that internal referral to that program. But if not, we will recommend a list of, I'm going to say geriatric care managers because I'm not going to remember the new title, but someone like Rebecca who can come out and then continue that partnership and build on the resources and information that the options counselor has provided you and help you continue down that path. Um, so, like everybody has said, you're not in it al alone. Um, we are there to help you with that process. Everything that Bay Path does is about keeping you in the community. We have uh, a, a wide variety of different programs and services from the personal care attendant where you hire your own personal care attendant to provide those activities of daily living to having a case manager who will develop a care plan so that you can have someone come in and do meal preparation or your laundry just because, because you have become physically less able or cognitively less able to understand those needs. So there are a lot of different actual programs and services, but start with getting the information and educating yourself on what they are that best fits you. And we will partner again with um, either our agency services or one of our community partners. And the social workers here, or outreach workers here at your senior center are also a very good place to start. Um, but it really is just the, you know, what, what is right for you as you age and um, what is available. Understanding that there are some age, related, age restrictions and or eligibilities. There are some income components to it. The most often sought program, which is the state subsidized home care program, which provides that type of all those services if needed, does have a cost share based on your household's income. The state subsidizes it with a, a line item in our taxes that they subsidize the home care program depending on your ability to pay your way. The more you have, the less subsidy, and the opposite is true as well. But we would help you through that process so that you would understand what's available. Not that there's anything wrong with nursing homes, but we are trying to keep you out of them for as long as possible, as safely as possible in the community setting of your choice. Thank you. So. Before I just talk a little bit about this, so the folks who, who do this for a living, they're all like these people, right? No, nobody, nobody's making a jillion dollars doing any of this stuff. They, they, they do this because they really like people, typically. They're just, they just really like this. And so the earlier that you can kind of engage with the folks who are doing this kind of stuff, the, the easier it's going to be for you to kind of figure out where you're going and the more likely it's going to be that if you've got a problem, you know who to call right away. That's the goal. That's the reason why you need to be talking to all these folks. So briefly, uh, as Fran mentioned right at the end, they're, they're, for some of the larger or, or more expansive programs that, that, that Bay Path administers, you need to be qualifying for MassHealth, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. 
I just want to talk about that very briefly. So once again, these, we're assuming these are uh, Frank and Mary's assets. They've got their house, 300000 savings account, Frank's IRA, and then they've got limited income. Notice Mary's income. So that if Mary, um, if Mary um, needs to qualify for something called a frail elder waiver, remember that income amount. So there are a number of things you want to think about um, when you are Frank and Mary and maybe you're having some problems uh, and need some assistance. First, remember if you're paying for somebody at home to help out and either your doctor or a nurse or a social worker will certify that that person needs that assistance because you either need regular assistance with two of the activities of daily living which are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting and transferring uh, and, or because you've got some memory issues. If that certification is there, then the expenses of that home care person that you're paying are tax deductible, federally tax deductible. The reason why that's important is because remember Frank's got a really big IRA that he never wants to touch because he knows whenever he pulls out the money he's got to pay taxes on it. Well, you know, if he's pulling out $10,000 because he's providing $10,000 worth of home care for his wife and they've got that certification, he's effectively not paying any taxes on it because he's going to pull out $10,000 of income and he's going to have a medical deduction of $10,000. So he's really getting to use 100% of those dollars. So whenever people are, are providing for those kinds of services, I always say, you know, you, you, that's the money to use is your tax deferred money. Um, you can also this is the place where long-term care insurance can really, really help you. Um, there was a mention regarding a kind of a large program that, that is administered through Fran's office, and, and we always refer to it as the Frail Elder Waiver, or they often call it the Choices Program, Choices. Um, in order to qualify for that program, through which MassHealth will pay for really up to 40 or 50 hours of home care, uh, you need to qualify for, for um, Mass. you have to qualify for MassHealth. But Mary, if Mary needed that kind of care, could quickly qualify for MassHealth. The reason for that is that in order for her to qualify, she need, would need to show that she had less than $2,000 in countable assets. However, her husband, Frank, can, have, can own the home, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to this magic number that I had mentioned earlier, $126,420, and can have unlimited income. And therefore, if Mary needed care at this point, Mary could simply, at that day, shift all of the assets to Frank, shift the house and all of these other things, or if she was having trouble signing things, presumably the person with her power of attorney could sign for her, shifting all of the assets. Um, Frank could then, to the extent that he had over that magic amount of money, which he would in this case, he'd have too much money, use that money to buy an annuity, as long as that annuity called for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's life expectancy, which you know at this point is about seven years or eight years, um, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. Frank can have unlimited income. The day after the assets are shifted to Frank and he buys the annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. So all of that can be done at the last minute. Um, if you're talking, I'm going to skip that. Um, the reason why those issues become more and more important as folks get older is really this. Uh, this these are from the Alzheimer's Association. If you're 65, your like, likelihood of having a disease that causes dementia and needing this kind of care is about one in three. If you're 85, it's one in, excuse me, is, about, is one in nine. If you're 85, it's one in three. So the older you get, the more likely it is that you might need that kind of care. I'm just gonna mention one other thing. At this point, when Frank and Mary are figuring out their, their, their estate planning goals, they want to make sure they've changed their wills to protect each other. And that's most seniors, most Frank and Marys that I know, that's their biggest goal in life. They've raised their kids and they'd love to leave something to their kids, that's fine. But they really just want to take care of each other, right? As I tell my kids, I have three wonderful kids, I say, I love you very much, but I married your mother, right? She's the one that's really special, and I'm going to take care of her. So, if, and if that's the goal, then what you want to do at that point is you want to have wills that say that when I die, all the assets I would have left to my spouse, if she's still alive or he's still alive, will instead go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. As long as you have that in your will, all of the assets that you own at the moment of your death will immediately be safe, non-countable, and non-leanable if your spouse needs to qualify for mass health. So that's a kind of a piece of estate planning that you want to do. So, the bottom line is, if you're Frank and Mary, 
when you're starting to think about these issues, don't assume that you're just going to figure them out yourself, right? I mean, you can try. You can go to try to get all of these programs figured out, or you can just talk to your daughter about it. There's inevitably a designated daughter that people are a designated son, right? And they're going to know a little bit, little bit about this, and they're going to try to be helpful, but they won't know nearly what these people know. So you need to be talking to some of the people who are just involved in this stuff. You're going to find they're going to be really helpful for you at all ages. If you found this just fascinating, uh, first of all, thank you for, to Hopkinton Cable for covering this. I really, really appreciate it because this gets played so that folks who couldn't be here can see it. Uh, if you want to see it also, uh, you, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary, and you can see it there. Thank you very much. Could I have a quick round of applause for my wonderful guests?